I'm Ryan, this is 52 SE Friday, week six. What is a small polyp stony collection? How do we build our own stony reef? And does a phrase I'm interested because it's hard speak to you? Well, the challenges with a tank like this and how do we intend to solve them? All that is coming up. We call them reef builders for a reason. Small polyp stony corals are what makes up the foundation of many reefs. The edges of the reef may be the most obvious places to see what many would have thought was just rock, but it's really layer upon layer of reef building corals. These stony corals are also the foundation of life on the reef, providing habitat for an overwhelming amount of life. All kinds of fish living within the branches, a safe haven for most of the vulnerable fish on the reef, but also those that depend on those fish for their survival. Without these corals, none of these animals would be here, that's what SPS reef keeping is all about, building our very own reef. They're called small polyp stony corals because the coral is not really an animal itself, but a colony of small animals, a collection of these small polyps, each of which is its own unique animal. Just a single one of these polyps can actually grow into a healthy coral. Large reefs of these corals developing through natural growth and spreading, others through storms distributing fragments to new areas, and even natural spawning events where the ocean's currents will spread the corals to new reefs. These newly settled reefs often very diverse with a wide variety of coral, but over time it's common for just a few corals that are best adapted to that specific environment to take over. Which coral that is depends on the environment and a bit of luck, the stony reef in constant states of evolution. Here's a challenge and difference with an SPS collector's tank. We're not attempting to create a large established reef where commonly just a few corals and colors dominate. We're emulating a younger reef or one that has environmental events that encourages diversity with a wide range of colors in coral. What we're looking for is rare color morphs, the corals that really stand out from all the others and then create a diverse collection of these in our marine tank. One of the coolest elements of a small polyp stony collection is it's not just sustainable. SPS reef keeping puts more corals on the planet than it takes, creates millions of biological banks or arcs around the world, and I believe SPS reef keeping has a net positive on global marine life. That's because SPS reefers rarely use collected wild coral. A vast majority of corals are farmed. Domestic farming more productive than diving, collecting, and shipping all over the world. Farm corals are selected for their brilliance. They are more likely to maintain that brilliance in your tank as well, have fewer parasites, and overall higher success rates in the marine tank. Our mission with today's episode, help anyone inspired by this type of marine tank build their own SPS reef successfully, and ultimately the type of growth that produces frags for future reefers. So how do we build a habitat for these reef building corals? What kind of scape serves their natural growth patterns? How can we build the scape to support their biology and something that looks stunning at the same time? Our solution starts with the Nios Opus 2 440. There's one thing that makes this better than most tanks out there for this style of tank. The overflow box is external, meaning there's no internal overflow box to deal with. That means we can build a better scape. There's more room for corals, but more importantly, way better flow characteristics in the tank. Getting flow behind the rock creates all kinds of benefits for a tank like this one. You'll find near universal agreement amongst SPS reefers that whenever possible, an external overflow is the way to go. For Rockscape, this is a unique style of tank where there's no universal rock structure or habitat from the ocean to emulate. These are reef building corals that create their own structure. The aquascape just needs to accommodate the corals, which will ultimately become the stony aquascape. The underlying rock is just a base for the corals to start from. My own biggest challenge is I want the tank to look full or complete day one, and I always want to build a structure larger than I should. I don't want the tank to look empty or incomplete when I'm done. However, with an SPS scape, one of the ways you know you did this right is the tank does look incomplete because it's the coral growth that will complete it. Something that I have to remind myself throughout the entire process. There are five considerations that I believe will help anyone who attempts an SPS scape to be more successful. Microbiome, height, slope, island versus wall, flow, and pollution export. Microbiome is first because it will dictate what type of rock you use. With most lower par tank styles, I use dry rock almost exclusively because I take my time creating the perfect scape and will take a day or two to do that. Dry rock is less expensive, avoids the pests, and the lower par doesn't have as many issues with photosynthetic slimes or algae. In a high par SPS tank, it's different. They often require healthy bacteria, archaea, coralline algae, and microcrustacean populations to find a balance with the photosynthetic slimes and algae that are competing with them. It's also just not the slimes. The SPS corals just do better in tanks with established rocks. There'll be fewer mortalities and hurdles with dry rock that's been in the tank for 6 to 12 months or wet live rock, which speeds that process up. 
It's a microscopic battle that we can't win outright, but we can influence who has the upper hand and make the start of our tanks a lot easier. Our solution for this tank, TBS Tampa Bay Saltwater Rock, rock that's farmed in the ocean, cured for years, collected by the divers, and then shipped in bags directly to your nearest airport. This is as live as it gets. We use the base rock in the Chromis Acro Tank, but in this one we use the TBS package, which is some base rock and their premium rock that has a lot more sponges and life on it. Comes with TBS sand as well as some cleanup crew. Note that wet rock is not a magic cure to avoiding the ugly stage. There are photosynthetic pests on it that comes from the wild because it was under the sun just a matter of days ago. You saw it in the biome experiments. In this case, we cure the rock with just ambient room light for just over a month to set some of the photosynthetics back. We'll likely experience a burst of something, but combined with microbiome, a good approach to flow, utilitarian fish, and cleanup clue in the tank, it will dramatically increase the odds that it happens rapidly so we can start adding corals to a stable tank. With rock selected, consider height. In a typical 24 inch tall tank, keep the scape below the midway point or about 12 inches. That's because a typical showpiece colony is about 6 to 8 inches in the end and we need about 4 plus inches of water over the top to provide for flow. I'll show why that flow over the top produces better results in a moment, but be prepared that the tank will not look full when it's scaped only halfway up. Next, we slope from front to back with tiers of coral placement locations. Essentially, you want to create tiers of coral where the corals above don't shade those below from light or block flow. When you look through the side of the tank, it should be obvious that the corals will create a natural slope from front to back. We also consider the in-between. By breaking the scape up into multiple segments, we create some visual interest, but I also allow for the coral growth in between the depth between the aquascape segments. This also allows for another flow axis point in between the structures, with flow from power heads on the back colliding and flushing water forward. In fact, throughout the entire thing, we're always considering not just how to display the corals or how attractive the scape will be, but how do I get flow where it needs to be? Will the scape block flow or create flow challenges? A vast majority of today's SPS tanks leaving room for flow behind the aquascape. This is where the Nios Opus tank selection comes in. I just don't want an overflow tower in the center messing with my scape desires or blocking flow. How flow is addressed in an SPS tank will dictate success more than any other tank type. We're also considering pollution export. SPS corals are more sensitive to pollution and water quality than others. For that reason, we avoid piles of rock where pollution collects permanently. The inevitable areas that do collect pollution should be easy to blow out completely with a small pump like a maxi jet or Pima. With all these factors that go into the ideal scape, you can see why I typically prefer dry rock and taking my time to do this, but this series doesn't have the time for a prolonged microbiome cycle or hurdle, so wet TBS is our solution. Because this rock is so live, you need to work quickly with your aquascaping technique and have limited time out of water. We used a mix of stacking, superglue gel, and silicone-based epoxy to hold it all together and fight gravity where stacking alone isn't enough. My goal is to hide or blend the seams, find the pieces that edge match together so it doesn't look like a stack of rocks for the next year. The epoxy helps us create overhangs and some visual appeal that's not possible with stacking alone. The process we use looks like this. Hold the rock together securely, spray some of the super glue accelerator on the rock points where you want the glue to immediately adhere to, which is particularly important on wet surfaces. Then we mix a healthy amount of MaxSpec silicone-based epoxy, often about half the can, spray the epoxy with the accelerator so the glue sticks to it immediately, and then a healthy amount of super glue gel and smoosh into place. Once you got it right, repeat with a small piece of rubble to hide the epoxy and cover it up. We use MaxSpec silicone based epoxy because it doesn't immediately deteriorate like normal epoxy does when it's wet and it's much lower cost than other aquarium silicone epoxies. Silicone epoxy has some flex and it isn't as strong as standard epoxy so you may need to use a thicker joint or bond. The goal is to get the silicone epoxy to wrap around as many structural surfaces as possible for a structural hold. The glue is just a secondary bond. The net result of that is what will become a three-tiered coral islands that are structurally sound, have some visual interest today, allows for flow and easy pollution export, the habitat, the basis for everything else we do, and our success. A common thread in this series is that the corals typically grow towards the environment that best supports their biology. In this case, the polyps on the coral that receives the right type and amount of photons or light energy will not only grow faster than the parts of the coral that receive too little, but will typically have much better coloration as well. You can leverage that knowledge to your advantage. The biggest lighting challenge that today's SPS reefer faces is where are the best sources of light coming from in the tank and are those photons reaching their target? 
PAR measures the number of photons hitting the area per square second. Spectrum measures if they're the right type of photons, but shading considers if those photons are getting where they need to go or are they simply blocked from ever reaching their target. SPS corals are reef building corals that require a lot of light and they grow rapidly. The shadows larger corals cast will stunt, deform, or kill the smaller corals below or beside them. On top of that, anyone who's seen the top down shot of an SPS tank knows where the best coloration is. That's partially because the corals grow towards the best biology and with today's modular lighting, that's the center of the top of the tank. Viewing from the top of the tank looking down will be the best look, but we can leverage that knowledge to make the front display pane look almost as stunning. Our solution is to get as many of the photons to actually come from the front half of the tank and even from the front pane of glass as possible. So the corals grow forward and face not just up, but towards the viewing pane where we can enjoy them. To do that, we position the light in the front half of the tank and then use multiple wide angle light sources with the Kessel AI Blade Hybrid Combo. This solution not only positions much of the light out front for the corals to grow to, but leverages the glass to become a reflective light source to grow towards as well, rather than just upward, and then blankets the tank in hard to shade light. We then tune these settings to hit 200 to 350 par in as much of the tank as possible with the solar blue spectrum that mimics the blue energy from the sun in the tropics at about 15 feet down. That blanket of light sounds logical and it's easy to see how modular lights cast shadows, but larger lights engulf the coral and avoid shading issues. But more compelling is experience and results in actual tanks, emulating approaches that produce the desired results rather than theory alone. The BRS-160 was a very similar approach as this one with Kessels as the primaries and then front and back T5 fill light. The E-170 was one of the highest density coral to water tanks I've done with the same approach, Kessels with front and back T5 fill light. The 750XL using a totally different approach to the same goal with ultra wide angle XR30s turned sideways front to back and then spaced about a foot apart. In this case, the primary light source is wide angle reflections off the glass providing the fill light. If I had to do it over again, I think I would have used five just to get even better results. But the 750 is one of the best SPS tanks we've ever done. That's us, but nearly all of the most successful SPS dominant tanks out there share the same commonality, blanking the tank in hard to shade light. I'd like to demonstrate this compelling enough that we can put the conversation to bed and help not just ourselves, but future reefers. To do that, these are some of the most recent reef to reef SPS tanks of the month. These are people who have also achieved the dream and approaches worth emulating. One with the ATI LED T5 hybrid light source is nearly the size of the tank itself, a blanket of wide angle light that leverages physical size and glass. Corals not just growing upward, but outward as well. Another that leverages wide angle LEDs with three XR30 radions flanked with ATI T5 fill light. This is the definition of a collector's tank with corals thriving regardless of placement of its neighbor. Another that leverages nine LED modules of various design, all very deliberately placed for purposeful coverage. A stunning tank with corals of various sizes, but after experience with a variety of LEDs, the narrower angled AI hydras plan to be replaced with the wider angled G6 radions. Another that's five Orphic icons turned front to back and placed nearly side to side and appears to be mounted high to blanket the tank and polyps in light. Just one look at this and you can understand why this tank thrives in a blanket coming from all angles. But it's a peninsula and on the other side, you can see in the center the effects of shadowing. Looks potentially intentional, but some coral types posing bigger challenges than others. Another six foot wide tank that's 36 inches front to back and has three XR30 radions in a row across the back and four XR30s in a row angled from the front, doing just what we're discussing today by getting the corals to grow towards the front rather than just the top a garden of well-developed corals that are putting their best face forward towards the glass. These are all successful paths worthy of emulation. Doesn't matter if you use these tools as long as you use the mentality behind the tools. For instance, you'll notice that the radions were not only part of many of these SPS dominant tanks of the month, but also what we believe was the most successful SPS tank here on Beers TV with the 750. So it's a worthy question. Why not radions on the 52SE SPS collectors tank here? The answer is because like everyone, I have specific desires that I've prioritized. Outside of ideal biology benefits of separate fill lights, I'm a shimmer fanatic and it needs to be just right for the tank to come alive. The Kessel Blade combo gives me the adjustable shimmer that I desire better than anything else that I've tried. I'm willing to put in the effort to mount the lights to the wall, tune five lights for spectrum and shimmer to achieve my goals. Gas exchange and water flow that drives it is another area where you can see the effects of better biology with the eye. 
the side of the coral that gets the best flow will have polyps that grow faster and therefore that side of the coral will grow faster towards ideal flow and biology. The side of the coral that's furthest from the flow will grow slower and worse, the corals that are behind that coral and flow is blocked will grow the slowest. That's the challenge. So why does flow do that? High flow can help with acquiring or eliminating carbon dioxide or oxygen gases from the photosynthetic and respiration process, as well as help us regulate the pH inside the coral. Most of you are also familiar with the term bleaching, which amongst other things is commonly the direct result of overactive rates of photosynthesis without adequate flow rates to help the coral eliminate toxic oxidants. The coral bleaches to survive. Adequate flow is one of the tools that can help prevent that. Saturated oxygen levels are of course important to the fish. Without O2 to drive respiration, they can't produce energy for movement or brain function. Low levels most commonly identified with slow, listless fish. Obviously something we want to avoid. There's the air aqua skimmer and flow breaking the surface tension for driving gas exchange with the room, an Ecotech battery backup driving gas exchange and providing life support during the inevitable power outage. But in the SPS tank, what we're really concerned about is getting that gas balanced water to the corals at the right velocity during the photosynthetic hours. The more light you have, the more important this is, and the basis of why flow is often considered not just as important as light, but maybe more important. To do that, we have three pairs of power heads, one set of gyres that are creating shifting currents and laminar turbulence over the tops of the corals. The flow over the tops of the corals and these gyres are unarguably the most important component of flow in an SPS tank for one reason alone. The polyps on the top of the corals are getting bombarded with the most photons and have the most rapid rates of photosynthesis and require the most attention to flow and gas exchange. There's a pair of opposing MP40s on the front to create shifting turbulence and support the light that we have intentionally put on the front of the tank. It's a combination of our attention to flow and light on the front of the tank that's going to produce that best biology and growth of coloration through the front viewing pane. We also have two Gyre 350 clouds mounted vertically across the back with shifting turbulence that's designed to flush the water forward through the spaces between the three different scapes as the laminar currents collide and water needs to be returned to the other side of the tank. One of the things about gyres is they need to be maintained a bit more than other pumps to maintain that high flow. We use the power monitor and the apex and the alarms to tell us when the gyres have slowed down, providing less flow. When that happens, we run the gyres in a bucket of water and citric acid for easy, need-based cleaning. The chemistry challenge with an SPS tank is they suck up carbonate alkalinity rapidly. In a high-density tank like this one, it could easily be 2 dKH a day, also important but to a lesser degree, calcium and magnesium. Also important but harder to track is the trace elements that regulate or contribute to the coral's metabolic functions. Just as important as the elements is the tank's pH. The tank's pH impacts the pH of the fluid inside the coral. The pH inside the coral dictates how fast the coral can precipitate new coral skeleton and how strong it is. It's commonly said the corals will grow much faster at a pH of 8.3, and our investigates show that that is true, but conceptually it's backwards. It's not that a high pH increases growth, it's that a low pH harms the coral's biology and slows growth. A more accurate way of saying it is corals at a pH of 7.8 will grow much slower because the low pH is preventing proper precipitation within the tissue and dissolving the skeletal structure, making it brittle, easily damaged, stressed, and more prone to mortalities. Our solution is a Triton's Core 7 to replenish elements on the Vectra forehead doser. The Core 7 is many times more concentrated as some other solutions, so there are fewer changeouts and risks of empty jugs. The Core 7 formulation elevates the pH during the day when we dose it and addresses trait element uptake from the corals and directly accounts for the refugium uptake on the system as well. The refugium soaking up excess CO2 at night and increasing the pH as well. One important note on this is despite what any additive system says in its packaging, it's impossible to create a perfectly balanced additive system that accounts for the exact element uptake of all corals and replenishment. The Triton system asks you to do ICP and then manage each individual element independently. Sounds good and ICP testing is solid, but still imperfect and the potential for errors is too high for me. It's just a bit too mad scientist for my taste. Alternatively, the second most common method of dealing with the inevitable less than perfect trace element replenishment is water changes, but that's also imperfect in theory. Typical water changes will increase element deficient water levels, but won't get them back up to normal and it only gets worse over time. That said, in actual practice, a good water change schedule seems to be enough to balance out the variables between uptake and a good two-part with complete elements, and that's what we'll be doing. 
A 1.25% auto water change a day, which is roughly the same as 10% weekly or 35% monthly, will ICP test annually to monitor performance or when we spot unexplainable issues. If needed, increase it to 2% daily, which replenishes half the water every month, and more than enough to smooth out imbalances, which is frankly cheaper than ICP and related element dosing without the same risk of testing or user error. One of the biggest fallacies our hobbies participated in is fish only need to eat once every day or two because that's what they do in the wild. Well, that may be true for some ambush predators. It's not true of almost any herbivore or small active fish that preys on plankton or small crustaceans. Most of these are eating almost all day long. Part of the reason why this belief has perpetuated is simply malnutrition is a slow death that the untrained eye has difficulty diagnosing. We haven't selected all the fish for this tank yet, but we'll look into the dietary needs of each and share how we go about meeting them in the livestock update episodes. It will likely be with the use of auto feeders like the AFS and various frozen foods. In addition to that, SPS corals require nitrogen and phosphorus to thrive in the aquarium that often comes in the form of inorganic nitrate and phosphate that builds up in the tank after fish food and waste decays in the tank. However, this is the same nitrate and phosphate that you test for, feeds algae and pests, and then slows calcification as well. In the wild ocean reefs, the corals are much more likely to acquire their nitrogen and phosphorus needs in organic forms. Organic meaning bound up in organic matter like proteins, amino acids, fish food, fish waste, decaying algae, bacteria, zooplankton, and other similar organics that contain nitrogen and phosphorus. We'll likely feed Brightwell's coral amino as well simply because we and our peers in coral farming have found that direct addition of amino acids help grow tissue faster as well as bring up better tissue coloration and fluorescence. Brightwell's coral amino being what we used in our experiments to prove it. Pollution control in a high density SPS collector tank is different at the start than it is at the end. When there are very few corals, they'll be the same as anything else and require a lot of attention. However, when the corals become larger and more dense, the corals themselves will become the primary filter as they uptake most of the organic and inorganic pollutants into their tissue growth. At the start, our overall method to pollution and filtration is called SPDID, short for suspension, particulate organics, dissolved organics, inorganic nutrients, and dilution. However, it's tuned to the needs or biology of each tank and what lives in it. With the six power heads located on the top, front, and back of the tank, the organic waste will be consistently suspended for prey capture by the corals and the skimmer removal. We'll not be using a felt sock or roller to remove particulate organics simply because we don't need the excess work from swapping out socks and unchained socks only strip out organic nutrition and hurts the other filter performance. An automatic roller would be nice for the first six to 12 months, but there's no room for it in the sump, so we'll forego it. However, we do want to remove a large portion of the inevitable dissolved organics with Max Specs Air Aqua Skimmer before they end up fueling the inorganic nutrient pollution and pest organisms. The DC recirculating skimmer can be tuned a lot easier to get more specific amounts of dissolved organics out. We'll then tune to find that balance between the needs of the corals and pollution control. That skimmer has an ozone upgrade kit that we're using for the Ozotech ozone unit, run one hour a day at night and ORP controlled by the Apex. That'll keep the tank free of organic yellow pigments, eliminate organic smells, break down coral toxins, and keep the water looking crystal clear 24-7. Once you see the clarity ozone can provide, you won't be without it again. Reefers spend fortunes on things like low iron glass, but ozone can be more impactful and certainly complementary. Inorganic nutrients, nitrate and phosphate, handled with the refugium. In this case, Niosump is mostly just a clean glass box, the way I like it. Doesn't pigeonhole me into the manufacturer's way of thinking. To create a fuge, we use some black aqua mesh and a Kessel Tuna sunlight to grow our catamorpha from algae barn. Dilution is performed daily with a dose-based AWC auto water change of 1.25% a day. Very few contaminants of any kind will become a problem when water changes are done regularly. SPS corals have a lot of known parasites, flatworms, and little red bugs and others. Our solution is to get corals from a farmer, in this case worldwide corals, which is 1,000 times less likely to have anything like that than a wild coral. However, things can get cross-contaminated with other tanks here at our facility, so we'll add predators like chorus rasses to the tanks, proactively use KZ's flatworm stop and coral booster to manage pests if they arise. These parasites find balance with corals in the wild, and they can in our tanks as well. In 52SC, we'll teach you how to perform proactive QT for fish parasites, but for these tanks, we're going to use Who Trained Me how to do that with marine collectors so they come treated for the most common parasites of ick, velvet, brook, flukes, and uranema before they get here. 
because nature is resilient and no protocol is perfect, applied perfectly 100% of the time or accounts for cross-contamination and human error. We also use a 57 watt aqua ultraviolet UV on this tank. This unit is oversized, which allows for less perfect flow rate monitoring and the compact high output model is small enough to fit under most stands. Mounted with Neat Aquatics UV brackets, which makes it a lot easier to mount and remove when needed. Thermal energy or temperature regulates the coral's metabolism. Cold water slows reactions down, warm water speeds them up. Something that we'll go into much deeper in the science episodes, but the net result of it is, if water gets too cold, things go bad slowly. If water gets too hot, they go bad rapidly. This is a particular concern for sensitive SPS corals in a high PAR environment where rapid changes in temperature can cause them to brown out as well as rapid tissue loss. The biggest factor influencing the temperature of the tank is actually the room temperature. In our case, it's a stable 70 degrees unless the HVAC goes out or someone inadvertently changes the thermostat. Tank temperature fine-tuned with two 200 watt BRS titanium heaters regulated by the apex to 78 degrees and then backed up by the innovative marine controllers set to 80. Tune's AquaCheek fan set to 80 in the event of overheating by promoting evaporation and release of thermal energy. Alarms would tell us to come handle it if that goes wrong as well. Thermal energy will not be an issue in this tank. Our solution to environmental monitoring and management is the Apex simply because it's what I've had the most experience with and it's saved the tanks here at BRS more times than I can count. That said, use whatever monitoring control system you trust and fits the tank's budget. Many can be had for less than what a handful of frags cost and I can say with 100% certainty that any of them will save your tank multiple times. Our solution considers it three ways, monitoring first, redundant management second, and then convenience third. A good monitor will just tell you when something's wrong, leaks, salt spray, temperature, pH and chemistry, ORP and organics, water level and standard parameters. More advanced monitoring solutions will monitor for power outages, actually power consumption of individual pieces of equipment to know when you need maintenance on them, if they're broken or if they're on or off when they shouldn't be, chemistry parameters like calcium, alkalinity and magnesium, automated and graft, even flow rates through the pipes. This is all easy. Anyone can install it and at this point we know the moment that anything's wrong with the tank, specifically when it happens and we're not around to notice. A controller or environmental management is different. In this case, we're replacing a dozen different controllers that are built into the heaters, lights, power heads, returns, filters, AWC dilution systems, and other gear with a centralized system controller as a primary and use the equipment's own controllers to back up, redundancy. But sometimes the other way around as well, with equipment like the ATO or advanced dosing pumps, the Apex is the logical backup. The environmental management controller also replaces the independent safety equipment like the pH and ORP controllers. How necessary this type of redundancy is, is mostly the answer to one question. Am I able to leave what I'm doing when the alarm goes off, or would I like to be able to just turn off the offending gear or backup remotely with an app, or have the solutions automated? In our case, we're not here from 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. on weekends or holidays, which is 100 plus days a year, and we go on vacations. So some level of automation and remote access is a requirement. The third consideration are just convenience functions we implemented with feed modes, maintenance modes, push button water changes, automatic under cabinet lights, convenience feeders, switches that power everything on the tank up or down with a flip of a switch, automatic testing and parameter displayed right next to the tank. Not necessary functions, but the types of things that make reefing easier. That's the mission with the SPS Collector's Tank, the unique environmental challenges and how we intend to handle them. Next week, time to meet the Soft Coral Collection, evolving a garden of coral. These things have a sway to them, colors like a garden, and even better, they're easy. BRS TV subscribers get to see it all in the full 52SE playlist right here.